Hi everybody, welcome to tonight's webinar with Dr. Jake Cook. Dr. Jake Cook was one of the first in the UK to start using the Econia lasers and he's now been using them for about three years. So he can really share his valuable experience as to how he's incorporated the laser into his practice. As usual, any questions, please put them in the question box on the um, right hand side and we will ask them at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to pass you over now to Jake and um, enjoy the webinar. Any questions, like I say, put them in the chat box. So over to you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you all for joining me at the end of a busy Monday. Um, today we're going to be talking about the effect of photobiomodulation on cartilage. In particular, we're going to be looking at osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and TMD. So let's get straight into it. So knee osteoarthritis, it's the most common form of arthritis and it's associated with pain and inflammation of the joint capsule, impaired muscular stability, uh, reduced range of motion and functional disability. It's incredibly common. Um, so we see damage to the articular cartilage, to the subchondral bone, and that damage really uh, results in a narrowing of the joint space. Lifetime risk of knee osteoarthritis is estimated to be about 46% in adults and unfortunately increases with age. Due to our societal trends, it's becoming more common, not less. So thanks to that baby boomer generation, um, we have an aging population. And so it's quite natural that osteoarthritis is becoming more common. Unfortunately, we also have a obese population. So in the UK, we're used to pointing fingers at America. I was looking at this research just the other day. In the UK, about 28% of uh, UK adults are obese. And it's about another third on top of that overweight. So very nearly two thirds of the adult UK population are overweight, um, with a third of them being obese, which is bad news. So you can imagine with knees, not only is that more weight uh, and mechanical stress going through the knees, but it's also all those inflammatory, uh, those inflammatory markers that come along with obesity. Joint injury, unfortunately, is a big risk factor for osteoarthritis. So if you tear a meniscus or tear ACL or PCL, then that's a high correlation or high predictor for de developing osteoarthritis because you've lost some of that stability. So very simply, as the joint moves more, there's more mechanical stress. So it's estimated that because of the age, aging population, the obesity um, that's now part of our society and joint injury, that they're expecting osteoarthritis to increase by 50% over the next 20, 20 years, which is a lot when we're already at 46% of the population will develop osteoarthritis at the moment. So there's some big numbers there. So today, obviously, the, the main topic is photobiomodulation, but first let's look at the gold standard. So what is the most effective way for treating osteoarthritis at this point in time? Non-pharmacological and um, non-surgical are the best. So we have surgery as a last resort. Pharmacological interventions can be helpful, but these are all the side effects. So NZs, for example, are classically used for osteoarthritis. NZs have been shown to be um, protective for the cartilage. They help prevent some of the um, some of the biochemical effects that we'll talk about later on. The problem is they come with all the other side effects like the gastrointestinal issues and um, delaying recovery and all sorts of stuff that we know about. So we want to look at non-surgical and non-pharmacological options first. And fortunately, exercise is currently the gold standard. There's nothing else that beats it yet. So we have high evidence for they're calling it standard exercise. That basically means aerobic exercise, strength exercise, and resistance training. And fortunately, it pretty much can be whatever you want, as long as it has some kind of aerobic strength or resistant aspect to it. Um, there's high quality evidence for that. And there's high evidence that not only does it reduce pain, um, but it can improve function and quality of life. There is moderate quality that it reduces disability. So that's obviously in people who are more who are more severe, whose symptoms are worse. Um, there's moderate qual quality that if they are disabled, they're not able to, to perform their daily activities easily. The exercise for them can still be effective. And the good news is that exercise can be prescribed for anybody. 
So it doesn't matter what your age is, your sex, your BMI, how severe the osteoarthritis is on, on, um, on x-rays or, or radiographic findings, or where you're starting. Exercise can be implemented at any point and seems to have benefits. Now, obviously, how much benefit is going to depend on how, down, how far down the road you are. Um, but that's definitely something we can't say about surgery, where there's definitely some patients we can't operate on, and pharmacology. So there has been a lot of research into exercise. Um, so um, in 2018, there was a huge umbrella study that looked at all the systematic reviews and all the meta-analysis for knee osteoarthritis and said, what can we recommend? You know, not just individual things, but overall, what can we recommend? Exercise was a big winner. Um, and they thought that was partly explained by the fact the initial neuromuscular response, uh, response and attempt to uh, adapt that specific exercise um, was followed by muscular atrophy. So you, part of osteoarthritis is that we have a change in neuromuscular control of the joint. So there's excessive stress. If we think that all movement is that, that, that um, challenge to balance stability and mobility. So if my joint is very stable, and let's say I fuse my elbow like this and it can't move at all, the joint is very stable, it's very stiff, but it's also very safe. You know, it's not just going to dislocate next time I try to pick up a pen. Um, the issue with it is that it's so stable and so stiff that I can't do anything with it. It's completely non-functional. So you could run against it, you could drop a bowling ball on it, it's not going to dislocate, it's not going to sprain a ligament. So what we have to do is we have to sacrifice some of that stability for mobility. So unfortunately, as we, as we sacrifice that stability, our safety comes down and our range of motion increases, but our risk of injury increases at the same time. So we're trying to keep this balancing active, a stiff, stable joint that is safe, but a mobile joint that is functional. In osteoarthritis, we seem to have a, that, that, con, that balancing act has failed somewhat. So we don't have that precise neuromuscular control to keep the joints as safe as possible. So it's, it's more than just wear and tear. There's actual changes in muscular control there. So in this study, they were suggesting that introducing exercise helps to improve the neuromuscular control of a joint, which reduces mechanical stress. And on top of that, you get hypertrophy of muscles, again, which helps to stabilize. So you're taking stress off of the ligaments and the tendons, or sorry, off the ligaments and the cartilage, and you're putting it back onto the muscles who are much more adaptive, quicker to heal. So exercise has been shown to reduce pain, improve well-being and function, um, which appears to then have knock-on effects for gait. So as the pain goes down, as people start to feel better, they walk better. The more they can walk, the more they can get on with their daily activities, the better improvement in the mood, the more endorphins they have, the more dopamine they have, serotonin, all this other stuff. So exercise, it's not new information for you, I know, but exercise is leading us down this route. So, interestingly, high intensity exercise looks like it might be better than low intensity exercise, but the jury is still out on that. So there are some systematic reviews now that say, yes, we found high intensity training, even in elderly people, was more effective than low intensity training. However, the vast majority of research has been on low intensity exercise. So, it's still, we're at that, that um, unsure phase, perhaps a tipping point, but we don't know where we are yet. Um, I think one of the great things about yoga, and I like the fact, you know, uh, completely biased, but it's nice that it has moderate level evidence to support yoga for, for neo OA. Too late in the day to be doing tongue twisters. Unfortunately, everything in this, in this uh, lecture today is all tongue twisters. So, um, yoga reduces pain and improves mobility. We evolved to spend all day running, jumping, climbing trees, chasing animals, digging holes. Movement would have been very seasonal. So there would have been period, periods where we were plucking fruits from the trees and then a period where we were digging roots out the grounds like carrots and potatoes. There'd be time where we were chasing down antelopes. You know, there would be distinct phases where certain muscle groups would be allowed to have a rest and recover while others got bigger and stronger and we would have these distinct time periods. Whereas now, if you think we live the same lifestyle every day, we do the same work every day, you know, 
even if you're a chiropractor or physiotherapist, you know, we hopefully think we're the, the fit, healthy ones because we're standing up and moving all the time. Actually, if you look what you do on a daily basis, it's a very limited range of motion you're doing. It's this, you know, I remember feeling really depressed when I got a, a watch to track my steps, and my movement for the day and thought, God, I must, I'll be smashing it. I'll be doing so much a day. And my steps were pathetic because all I'm doing really is walking to the door and then walking to the bench and the few steps around the bench in a treatment don't really equate into much exercise. So I think one of the beauty, uh, one of the, the, the beauty of, of yoga is it makes you do all these weird and wonderful movements that you don't do in your normal day to day, but you might have in years gone by when you were trying to reach under a log to, to, I don't know, pull out a anteater is the word that's popping to my head. I don't know why you'd be trying to eat anteaters, but whatever it be, you'd be doing all these movements, picking up, uh, reaching up for fruits, throwing spears, all this different stuff. And um, we don't do any of it. So nice to know that yoga works. They were suggesting that initially you want to do a 40 to 90 minute session, which is quite a long session. So 40 minutes is the minimum every day for at least eight weeks to see a benefit in pain and mobility. Um, the research also worked for things like Tai Chi, basically any other movement, you know, Qigong, you think of it, that it worked. The vast majority of research has been done on low intensity isokinetic strengthening exercises, which are complicated to way of just saying, you know, just basically just doing reps. So concentric and eccentric. Um, classically focusing on knee extensor patterns. So basically, you know, if you just think of that classic one in the gym where you sit with the machine, you put the, the resistance down by your by your ankle and you lift the knee. That's basically what they did a lot of. Um, and they found that that has been effective if they do it three times a week or more, and they need 12 supervised sessions. That's basically just to make sure they're appropriately loading the knee, not doing too much, not doing too little. With three times a week of doing those isokinetic um, strength exercises to the knee, you have faster and longer results compared to yoga, qigong, tai chi, and all this other stuff. So basically weight training for the, for the knee seems to be the most effective at this point in time. Like I said, high intensity training seems to be on the up. So maybe um, maybe in a few years, that'll be the, the more current advice. So exercise of the gold standard, where does manual therapy fall into that? Because at the end of the day, we are manual therapists. You may be a personal trainer, but probably the majority of people watching this are in the chiropractic or physio or osteopath professions. So good news for us, uh, manual therapy, again, under this huge umbrella um, assessment recommended a manual therapy for knee osteoarthritis. There was a moderate level of evidence then. So it means the evidence could be improved on, but it's still pretty good. Improves the pain, stiffness, and physical function of the knee. And in that manual therapy bracket, you've got um, SMT, manipulation and mobilization. They also include things like clinical massage, Swedish massage, um, basically anything where you're just moving muscle, um, but manually, you're the one doing it for the patient. So passive treatment. So now we kind of had a recap on, on what already works and the stuff we kind of know. Let's try and look at some new information. So the physiological effects of low level laser therapy. Now, I'm actually trying to move away from saying low level laser. I'm trying to move into more talking about photobiomodulation. The reason is uh, low level laser incorporates quite a wide range of different wavelengths and intensities and stuff like that. So what we're trying to focus on what I'm trying to focus on is trying to get into my head photo biomodulation because it's the photochemical effects I'm interested in or the photobiological effects I'm interested in rather than thermal effects. Not to say that thermal effects aren't effective or they don't have their place or their time. Um, but with these lasers, with the Iconia lasers, with the one I have, they work through photo um, effects. So that's what I want to, to learn about at this point. So back in the 80s and early 90s a whole bunch of cool researchers did preclinical studies so preclinical means um animal studies uh petri dish studies you know aspirating fluid and then shining a laser on it and seeing what happens to the cells so not stuff that you could conclusively say we know it works for um 50 year old obese males but stuff that's just saying on a physiological basis, does it do anything at all? That was then the basis for the research that came afterwards that was clinical. So um, 
they found things like anti-inflammatory and analgesia effects of uh, red lasers, um, which is the, the laser that I think all of us have. They found an increased protein synthesis of rheumatoid synovial cells. So that's going to help with cartilage repair. They found normalization and permeability of the, of the synovial membrane. They found enhanced regional microcirculation to improve blood flow. And they found that it modified the level of antigen, antibody complexes, and stabilizes the membranes in RA. So they basically found a whole bunch of stuff that sounds like it could be beneficial to improving the um, improving the physiology of things like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. So um, again, to add on to that, in vivo, so in vitro is that they've taken things out of a living um, body, out of a living animal. You know, it's not, it's in a petri dish effectively. In vivo is that it's in a living subject. That might be human, that be, might be animal. I see it's gonna be in rats. So they found that in animal studies um, that there was uh, improved fibroblast and osteoblast activity. So it's going to be improving um, collagen cartilage and bone density and things like that, remodeling. They have collagen synthesis, bone regeneration, again, increased uh, microvascularization. So that stuff was all back in the 80s. So we want to know in the meantime, what has happened? So if we look at two recent studies, one from 2018 and one from 2021. Now, these studies were interesting because what they did is the vast majority of studies on OA are looking at purely symptoms. You know, it causes pain, does this therapy reduce pain? Uh, it causes stiffness, does this therapy reduce stiffness? Um, OA stops people from having a normal functional lifestyle, does this treatment stop it, uh, improve that? So what these studies did is they wanted to know that stuff, but they also wanted to go and look at those the biological effects. So um, we'll talk about osteoarthritis before we talk about OA. So in osteoarthritis, it's not just wear and tear. Um, it's an arthritis. So it's not just you are old, here it is. There's a physiological effect and there's inflammation as part of that process. And it's an important part of the process. The difference is with osteoarthritis is it's mechanical stress so mechanical mechanically induced stress results in inflammation because we get inflammation we have a release of cytokines so classically it would be interleukin um, 1b and tumor necrosis factor alpha the problem is when they're in there they start to exaggerate inflammation so the joint gets inflamed a little bit because of mechanical stress the inflammatory cytokines come along and start to increase inflammation as the joints become more inflamed, so those chondrocytes that are trying to maintain the cartilage, as they start to become inflamed, unfortunately they start to give out again more cytokines, chemokines, and matrix uh, metalloproteinases, MMPs. So cytokines are going to increase inflammation, they're going to increase pain. MMPs, when we talk about, um, in fact, so I got a pretty picture for you here. So as just a quick reminder of what the joints like. So we've got the bone up and above. So let's say that's the knee. The dark blue is the cartilage. The light blue is your synovial fluid. And you'll see there there's different cells. So we've got things like in the dark blue, you've got your chondrocytes. Um, and in the bone, in that pale, uh, pale area, you've got your osteoblast, osteoclast. So osteoblast, building bone, osteoclast, uh, removing bone. Both equally important for remodeling and keeping joints healthy, right? We don't like it when we have too much osteoclast activity and we start to become osteopenic, osteoporotic. We have the same thing happening with cartilage. We have cells like the chondrocytes uh, that want to repair cartilage and keep it healthy. And on the other side of that, we have things like MMPs that want to degrade cartilage and, and they're still important. They're part of the remodeling process. So when you get injured, you want MMPs there to help remove the debris and break stuff down so that you can then remodel. What we have with osteoarthritis is excessive activity of those MMPs. So basically, the rate of degradation outstrips repair. So we get this slow, you know, slow wear and tear, you know, slow degradation of, of the joint uh, joint space. Um, when that when cytokines like uh, interleukin one uh, beta infiltrate cartilage and synovial fluid. 
they cause the chondrocytes to become inflamed, which we just talked about. Um, the extracellular matrix, I'm sure you're all aware of, but basically it's outside of the chondrocytes. It's a, it's a fluid that basically is trying to maintain uh, an environment to keep cells healthy. Helps, you know, we have it all over our body, obviously, so it's not just related to the fluid, but it, it basically helps cells communicate and helps support the healthy cells. So when in osteoarthritis, what we start to see is that extracellular matrix starts to starts to um, starts to fail, becomes less healthy. We get more MMPs that are actively breaking it down. And this is what we've already talked about. So those substances are all considered catabolic. So they're breaking down um, cartilage and the extracellular matrix, also having effects on collagen type two and, um, and things like that. So what they did in these studies is they already me they measured pain, obviously, and found that there was a significant improvement in pain. But they also did um, imaging and found that after a period of low-level laser, that synovial width got slightly bigger, got slightly thicker, which is great news. So instead of the um, catabolic activity outstripping the, mend the healing side, it started to be able to shift the other way. Effectively, low-level laser, and that's all they did. They didn't do exercise or anything like that. So low-level laser basically created an environment where chondrocytes were able to stop being so inflamed, stop producing so much cytokines, and start to produce a healthier environment where they could actually start to regenerate. Um, they did this by, they literally went in and just aspirated fluid and, and took, you know, did chemical analysis on it. They also found that there was a reduced activity of substances like collagen type 2 um, C telopeptide, which is again something that's breaking down collagen and again those MMPs. So they found reduced cytokines, reduced MMPs. So quite simply, the amount of degradation reduced. Um, and that's what we've just talked about. And that's what we've just talked about. So I would love to sit here and say that all the research on photobiomodulation and the arthritis is in one direction but it's not. So I think it was back in the early 2000s, around 2004, the uh, WALT, which is the World Association for Laser Therapy, set out um, what they felt would be the best way for, for research to go. So for different joints. So this is what, these are the protocols you should be using for shoulder. These are the protocols you should be using for knee. And because they set those protocols out, that's where the research followed. So as a result, they felt back in 2004 that the best way to go would be with longer wave, low level laser. So 800 plus, 800 to 1000 nano, uh, uh, nanometers. So that's the research. So even those last two studies I was talking about, they were looking at longer range. So which is exciting because they had an effect. However, when you look at the research as a whole, and this is uh, from this information is from a the last systematic review for no, uh, knee osteoarthritis and uh, low-level laser, they found on the whole that it wasn't effective, but they were looking at 800 plus. The main reason for this was a high level of heterogeneity between studies, and which that's something unfortunately we have to get used to at the moment with. Um, low level laser is that there generally is a lot of differences between studies on how they did it. So variations in wavelength, the power, uh, the energy density, number and duration of treatments, the size of the exposure area, where they have it you know, focused in really tight or, or spread over a long area, just how they administer it. So the review found that there was too much variation between the studies. They couldn't pull enough data. And so there was some aspects were inclusive and some bits that they were able to pull they said it wasn't effective for neoarthritis a lot of those studies were looking at exercise plus low level laser and they found in a lot of them that the um, placebo group the laser wasn't beating the placebo group so patients still did better because of the exercise but they weren't doing significantly better um, because of this now that paper contradicts the systematic review before that um, which again often happens in low level in low level laser therapy that one systematic review says yes it's great the next one says ah no a few more papers have been uh, good quality papers have been uh, published and actually they went the other way and a few years later so that's where we're at with knees at the moment but not all is lost yet so we'll go through some other positive aspects later 
So like I said, they found no significant change for pain or stiffness. Um, most of the studies were using 830 uh, nm or more. The reason was that Walt felt at that time that it had a greater penetration. And for me, because you've got a lot of bone and the you know meniscus and stuff is quite deep, they wanted high level of penetration. So that maybe isn't the same thought process that we have these days, but that's the research we're with. Now that research paper is already old. So that was from 2015. I couldn't find any systematic reviews on low level laser and osteoarthritis that are newer. So they stopped collecting data from 2014. So you can imagine now that's already um, what eight years old. That's getting on the on the ancient site. So it's time that we have that updated. So not all loss, but for the for knee osteoarthritis and low level laser, at this point in time, there isn't a huge amount of clinical data for us to be able to say yes. The reason, the inspiration for this lecture in the first place, uh, or for this this research, sorry, for me doing this research, um, was treating a, a woman with a laser for her neck. She did fantastically with that, and then said, "My dad has terrible knees. Is that something you can use with it?" And I thought, mm, "I don't know. I haven't. I don't see a lot of knee patients. I'll go and look at the research." Um, and that's where this all came from. I'm sure you'll you'll have the same. You know, or you'll have parents. You know, my dad has pretty bad knees, and his question straight away is, "Can you can you use it?" So at this point in time, based on the clinical data, there's not a lot not a lot for the Aconia lasers around. So there are studies that look at 635, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but for osteoarthritis, we don't have that much. So for rheumatoid arthritis, um, the last Cochrane review was updated in 2005. So again, it's old now. We need we need some more research. But it's a Cochrane review, which means it's very good quality. Um, and they did a huge amount of subgroup analysis and all that sort of stuff. So it's a, a good paper. They found that there was, they have gold, silver, bronze, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, platinum, gold, silver, bronze, uh, and uh, another level below that. They found that there was silver level of evidence uh, back in 2005 that low level laser decreased pain and morning stiffness and rheumatoid arthritis. It also improved um, tip to palm flexibility. So it reduced. Uh, morning stiffness by something like 27 minutes, which is quite a lot, and it improved flexibility. Now, they didn't report, they didn't find that it improved things like um, swelling or skin traffic changes. Again, the vast majority of, of the lasers in that were using uh, over 800, but they did have um, uh, a bunch of them in there. So they had wavelengths from 632 up to 1000 which is you know you're, you're into the infrared you're into the warm phase there and that's that's again why i think maybe we want to start using photobiomodulation to try and differentiate purely photochemical interactions and those that have a more heat-based element to it now they had so much data in that they were able to look at subgroup analysis and they found there was no statistical dif difference between wavelengths so looking at one that had um, 630 versus 1000 they couldn't statistically say that one was better than the other but in their words they found there was a trend for improved outcomes with 632 uh, compared to 820 but the confidence intervals overlapped so they weren't able to say uh, uh, the definition that there was there so again 2005 it's time for for more research so one of the their takes from it was they felt perhaps laser irradiation positively modifies the sensory input into the central nerve system and improves an, and, and provides an improvement in the perception of pain localization to the error treatment, which is a complicated way of saying something. So what they found is in quite a lot of the studies for rheumatoid arthritis, they were lasering this hand and then seeing what the pain levels were like in this hand, which is an interesting idea. And what they found is that when they lasered this hand, the pain in this hand would get better. So one of their, their comments was, well, you're not even lasering, you know, you can't talk about penetration or absorption on this hand because that's not the one being, you know, on this hand, sorry, because that's not the one being affected. So the thought process, well, it must be having some effect on central nervous system, whether that's a release of endorphins or uh, an improvement in the way the brain perceives where the hand is, so it's able to send descending inhibition for pain, um, whether it improves oxidation or you know it reduces stress levels, so they suggested a, a bunch of different reasons. But again, back in 2005, their their thought process was more research. 
Um, but I thought it was interesting, especially when I think quite a few of us have heard um, people like Dr. Silverman talking about um, the systemic effects of laser. And that can sometimes be hard to understand of like, okay, well, if you're shining laser on the carpal tunnel, surely that's where the effect is. So I think it's quite interesting to see that in this rheumatoid arthritis, when, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is a horrible condition, very hard to treat, um, very painful to live with and very disabling. So quite cool that they're shining this hand, but seeing a systemic, systemic effect in this one. So um, we don't need to spend much time on this, but you know, rheumatoid arthritis is a bit of a, a, bit of a nightmare. Um, one of the other findings from this study, and especially in combination with the osteoarthritis systemic uh, systematic review, was a suggestion that perhaps low-level laser is more effective for small joints um, and less effective for big joints. So the knee osteoarthritis research is, is very up and down. The rheumatoid arthritis is actually more positive but they're often the research is on the hands. And the studies I looked at where they then looked at hands and knees, often the knee might not be, wouldn't change, but the hand would. So the suggestion there, of we've got smaller joints um, work that we're working with, is low level laser more effective for small joints? And the, the, you know, the catchphrase for today is we need more research. <laughs> um, but that, that's where we're at. So that led me on to temporal, uh, the TMJ temporal mandibular joint disorders. It's a smaller joint. So cardinal signs of TMJ. In fact, before I skip any further ahead, we're talking about, if I just skip back a, a little way, um, when we're looking at osteoarthritis in the knee, one of the big things I see in my clinic is I see a lot of balance disorders. So if you have the time and the space and you fancy getting involved, if you stand up right now, cross your arms over your chest, and stand on your right leg. What you should feel is your balance should be a ankle hip strategy. So your foot should not be doing all the work, nor should your body be absolutely rock solid while your fit's like wobbling around. Your head should stay fairly static while your body and your uh, foot work together. You can bring that out more, again, as make sure you're in a safe space to do this, but if you close your eyes, you might suddenly see that your ankle starts really wobbling around. You're gonna see that with patients all the time. So especially those who've had ankle injuries and they've lost some proprioception so they can't feel the joint very well, or they've sprained ligaments so they can't stabilize the, the ankle very well. Where it moves more, you can imagine you're gonna get more mechanical stress through the ankle. However, the knee, if you now look at your knee, you're gonna feel that knee um, rocking side to side, which is not a movement the knee likes. You know, it likes flexion extension, it doesn't like to have these valgus and various stresses put upon it. So you can imagine if every time you walk, every step you take, the knee is gonna be, the foot is gonna be wobbling and the knee's having these small valgus and various stresses put upon it, that's gonna induce more mechanical stress than, than is perhaps necessary. Ankle strategies are a predictor for low back pain. So they're a sign of low back pain, you know, so if you stand on one leg and you see the ankle going, it's a reflection of low back pain because the, the uh, person starts to brace the low back to stabilize more and where they're braced they can't use an, a, a hip strategy that complex hip low back complex is just braced so the ankle is left doing all the work by itself um, so it's a reflection of back pain but it's also a predictor so with patients who have that and you're treating with back pain you also then want to go and try and do balance rehab to try and improve that hip ankle strategy so they're not wearing out their knees faster than they do think of how many steps you do it you know talking about them you know watch, watches that track your activity if we're aiming for a minimum of seven thousand steps or hopefully ten thousand steps a day you know it's a minimum of 5k every day um if every step you take the knee is taking more stress that over time adds up Anyway, back to TMD. So the cardinal signs of, of um, TMD are pain, reduced range of motion, um, midline deviations, uh, noises coming from the jaw, from the jaw cracking, locking, um, and malocclusion so that their bite isn't fitting quite well. So either too far forward or, or, or too far back. 
there's classically three forms for it. Myofascial pain is a classic one. It's well, not just a classic one, it's the most common one. Second is internal derangement of the joints. So that's where we start to get that disc popping back and forth. Um, and the most severe, but fortunately the least common of the three is DJD, where you, that disc has been moving for a while and the joint really starts to degenerate. Again, it's osteoarthritis, it's the same thing. You've got mechanical stress leading to inflammation. That inflammation leads to more inflammation that results in degradation of the um, synovial fluid, the capsule, um, sorry, the synovial fluid and the cartilage. So, um, why? It's a question I get all the time from, from people. Why does it happen? Stress induced repetitive uh, jaw clenching and grinding is one of the primary causes. And stress is one of the main reasons for TMD to continue. So I'll share a personal story with you. So I, um, I have had TMD twice. The first was my first year out, out of clinic. Uh, and I graduated in 2009, so it was right in the midst of the financial 2008 financial crisis. Um, there were very few jobs, and the clinics were quiet. And the job I had was with a lovely clinic and lovely boss, but the, it was admittedly very quiet. And I spent so much time yawning, just sitting in my waiting room, hoping someone would ring or someone would come in. I spent so much time yawning that I started subluxing the disc, so it started clicking and popping the time and became painful. Um, now, fortunately with time, once I got busy and started seeing patients, I wasn't yawning so much, that, that settled down. The second time I experienced it was when I moved back from the Netherlands and I made the mistake of investing all my money into a Dutch barge. It's this big 30 meter long boat that I was, it was the dream, I was gonna live on the boat and be all romantic and you know, women were gonna flood the boat and party with me and it was gonna be a grand old time. Uh, and that didn't happen, the boat was an absolute nightmare. Uh, everything boat broke constantly. We only went maybe two weeks at a time without losing something significant. That first winter, I didn't get the central heating working until February. So it was a pretty stressful time. Um, and one day I realized that I could feel a, a really sharp tooth at the back here. And before I knew it, I realized that I had chipped just teeth all around my jaw over about a six month period. And that was just nighttime grinding. So in six month period, it just absolutely <laughs> chipped all these teeth. Luckily, once the boat settled down and we got it sold, all that has, has calmed down. But stress was the main main aspect in it. Now, unfortunately, because it's stress and it doesn't go away, you know, we've got the same job, same stressful environment, um, you know, all the things that can cause stress in a lifetime, two years worth of COVID, four years worth of Brexit, all the stuff we you know, fear that we've been seeing in the news, 75% of TMD has chronic um, features. So that's things like depression, anxiety, um, pain sensitization, so it's now more sensitive to touch than it should be, or pain radiating into other adjacent areas. So the primary area is painful, which is reasonable because we've got that osteoarthritis in there, but because the pain has been going on for so long and I'm so stressed, I'm not inhibiting pain very well, we get pain excitation at the uh, level of the, uh, the brain stem and spinal cord, and that pain starts to spread down into my neck. So now I've got jaw pain, headaches, neck pain. If it's allowed to continue, that pain starts to spread into my arm, down to my shoulder, and, and onwards. Um, so stress is a major component of it. So trying to treat it, you know, we want something that can help. Now, whereas the research with knee osteoarthritis is very hit and miss, you know, one RCT says it's good, another RCT says it doesn't do anything. Low level laser therapy uh, affairs, affair, appears effective in diminishing, diminishing pain. And there was moderate quality evidence in the last big systematic review from 2021. For some reason, low level laser and dentistry, dentists love low level laser. So there's loads of research on low level laser and um, dental applications, including TMD. So there's been like seven different systematic reviews over the last 10 years. Uh, and the majority of them are in favor. So there's one or two that go the other way and say it wasn't statistically significant, but the vast majority say it's in favor, including the most recent one and the most recent meta-analysis. So that was 2020 was the meta-analysis, 2021 was the new systematic review, the large one. Um, so they found it was effective, moderate level uh, of evidence for reducing pain, um, variable effects on outcomes of secondary measures. So pain is always the first one they're interested in. Secondary would be range of motion, medial uh, midline deviation, clicking and popping. So you can tell patients with confidence this should reduce your pain. And hopefully 
it will improve your range of motion and you know uh, improve the function of the jaw. But we're not 100% confident about that bit, but we're more confident about the, the first part. Um, chewing was the part I missed there. So uh, not just range of motion, but actual strength being able to chew your food properly. Now it is short-term relief. So in these studies, in the systematic reviews, um, you're looking up to about four weeks. So that would be if you're using low-level laser purely by itself, but again, we're manual therapists. So you can think of low-level lasers helping you reduce pain, and then you're going to use your manual therapy to um, to improve the mobility, improve function, improve stre strength, uh, improve the ability to chew and masticate and things like that. Um, again, the wavelengths vary from 632 up to uh, 1064, again, because uh, Walt suggests that's where the research go, but there was more research here looking at the 632, which for us is, is interesting. Um, furthermore, they found that combining lasers of two different wavelengths seem to have, uh, the, the studies, sorry, the studies included, included that systematic review that, include, that use more than two wavelengths all have positive results compared to studies that only use one. And the studies that use two often had wavelengths of a shorter, um, a shorter wavelength, so like 600. Um, so again, interesting, especially for those who have the EVLR, where you've got the blue light and red light. Um, so some evidence from other people supporting that. Now, a big one that we often talk about is power. People always want to think, you know, the more power the machine has, the better. Um, they found in these big systematic reviews that the, the research papers that used more power, have more energy, were less effective. So they found that machines that were less than 10 joules per centimeter squared had the best results. Ones that were between 50 to 100 or 100 plus were not effective. Um, and other research uh, that's from preclinical data has suggested that it can be detrimental. So the lower the amount of energy per centimeter square is more beneficial. And as you start to go higher, uh, the heat starts to increase, that can actually damage uh, mitochondria and DNA. So it's a reason for not, you know, when you say we've got um, thermal effects, they have their time and place, absolutely. You know, the, the fact that all these research papers are using more thermal effects and getting improvements is great, but you'd have to be more careful about how long you use the exposure for, how frequently you do it. Um, whereas when you're using a lower, you know, below that 10 joules, you don't have to be, we don't have to worry about damage. So you can use it with more certainty that you're not, there's no side effects to it. So, I appreciate we've only got a short period of time, so I'm not going to go on any longer for today. In summary, I appreciate there's a lot of information there. So, low level laser, if you're looking at preclinical data and clinical data, it appears to create an environment for chondrocytes to restore and repair. But, um, and it's sorry, and it does that by inhibiting levels of uh, cytokines, interleukin uh, 1 beta. Uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, MMPs, interleukin-6, things like this. But we need a lot more research, and we need more research for short-wave photobiomodulation. So, you know, for us to have EVLR, we're looking for things that are from that kind of 400 to, to you know, 600 wavelength, rather than the majority of studies that at the moment for knee osteoarthritis are starting at 800 plus. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I hope that's not a downer. I, I, when we do these presentations, I always want to give honest research. So it'd be very easy to go and cherry pick the ones that just support our, you know, su support what we do. And I think it's the same with chiropractic. It'd be very easy just to cherry pick the ones that say SMT which fixes all, all, all ills in life. But I hope, I hope it's valuable to you to have a more honest approach of where's the research currently at. Um, we have the same thing with spinal manipulation for a long time. One study says it's great, one says it's rubbish. Does it work for headaches? Absolutely not. Oh, yes, it does. So I think there's the same thing in, in, in photobiomodulation at the moment, that we need um, more research and uh, a divide of it. So we're looking at short wave and long wave. It's not to say that long wave doesn't have a time place, but we need to understand when to use one and the other. Um, Thanks, so that's Jay. Just, oh. Very welcome. <laughs> I have a question for you, a couple of questions, if that's okay. 
Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on disc regeneration? Yeah, so the research I looked at, um, if we're looking for, I'm going to assume that disc is lumbar disc, um, I actually couldn't find much. So I spent a long time, that's where this started. So it started with knee and then the obvious place was by my chiropractor, what does this do for, for um, disc herniations? I actually couldn't find much research that looked at disc herniations. Um, it all led towards this uh, knee osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and temporary uh, and TMD. So I, sus I think based on the, the research I found, I think it probably, it should be a benefit. But like I said earlier, the research seemed to show that small joints seem to benefit more from low level laser at this point in time. So TMD and hands and feet seem to do better. Um, like I said, the research currently is all at 820, so they work in a slightly different way to, to the 600s. So um, I would say I feel positive about it, but I, we do need more research to say is that is that a certainty. Um, Sasha's also suggested that maybe we should run a group research project on OA. You know, it's not a bad shout. Yeah, we can we can definitely have a discussion about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And also, if you go obviously higher than 800 nanometers, this will have um, somewhat of a heating effect. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah, absolutely. So as you start to go above 800, you're moving into more of that infrared range. So you're starting to get more, more heat generation, um, which is when they're talking about joules, that's not, um, um, it's not something you're you have to worry about don't don't bother trying to calculate it or anything it's just in research but as they go above 800 towards a thousand you're getting more heat which is meaning you're getting more energy but you're cooking you're basically cooking things so that sounds a dramatic way of saying it don't <laughs> you're not you're not frying a patient but that not is effectively this but... <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. um, that's another reason why pulsed lasers are you won't see an 800 laser that's not pulsed uh, that's not content sorry let me say that again they're all pulsed waves, they're not con continuous because continuous would produce too much heat and you start damaging tissue quickly. So they pulse it so that the heat has time to dissipate. Um, there's also some um, um, preclinical data that looks at cellular processing and pulsing seems to give the cells time to get through their chemical reactions and then receive the next hit. Um, but yes, waffly way of saying yes, above 800 you get some heat. <laughs> Um, and also, he isn't. Uh, Sash has also commented saying he isn't very therapeutic with pain inflamed joints. Yeah, I agree. So it will have its time and place. There'll be definitely some conditions, and there's research to show you know that that these these uh, infrared devices are effective and stuff. But I wouldn't want to use it on someone who's in chronic pain. I wouldn't want to use it in a nerve. Yeah, definitely. Does anyone have any more questions that they want to put in um, the question box? If you don't, um, I'll give it a, a couple of seconds. If you don't, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for joining the webinar tonight. And thank you, Jake, for your really insightful approach. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is Vanessa, and I am the UK manager for Econia. So please feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Jake, for your time as well. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope it was useful to you guys. If you have any questions, just contact me. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.